Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, uh, this is uh, PWSP. We have together today uh, Comp, the, the public relational um, in charge for Hadir. Uh, it will be monitoring the chat as I talk so that I, I can try to focus on what I'm saying and then he can answer your question. So then welcome to interrupt me so I have some of the answer on the record here. Um, so, what's happened in uh, in Pagur over the last year? So, I'll start, I'll start with a short presentation on uh, what Pagur is and what it does. Uh, we'll go through some of the recent features that we've had. Some of them are upstream. Some of them are uh, these kids, so src.fira.project.org. We'll go through some of the roadmaps and IDs and some of the statistics around the projects and then of course uh and we'll rp to to answer them so i am a little bit chippy so i don't know if i should shut guess the only possibility which i have is to turn off my camera uh, well then you won't have to you won't see me for what it's worth your camera is already not on me to me this way well let well let's see if that works better then um, so I'm not sending my camera anymore. So you should only hear me and see the video, the slides. Yeah. Does that sound better? Yeah, you seem to be okay now. And I turned off my video so that it doesn't stress your connection. Okay. Well, uh, let's All keep right. it this way then. So Pagur, uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, it's a Git-centric, Python-based uh, project hosting platforms. Uh, it's meant to host for every project the source code of the project, if there is any. The documentation about the projects, there is a ticket trackers, and it offers the, the possibility of having pull requests to the source code uh, tracker, well, the Git repository. Uh, and this pull request allows uh, flags, um, which are waived for third party toolings to integrate with, uh, with these pull requests. Um, it is meant to have no lock-in. Uh, it is also extensible. It is built in a way that you can uh, change the teaming, but you can also add your own endpoints, new API endpoints, dedicated endpoints, uh, new UI frame. It's uh, it's really meant to to be able to allow you to to customize it to to your needs. That being said, we've added a, a number of features upstream, which you therefore no longer have to do if you're interested to have them. Uh, one of them, which actually landed only in production this week, was the, the boards feature. So it's a, a very lightweight cabin board. Uh, you can have as many boards as you like per project. Every board is linked to a specific tag. So when you add a ticket, when you tag a ticket with that tag, it will automatically be linked to the, to the board. Uh, it, you can have different statues. So there are one status is one column on the board. Uh, there is one of these statues that is set as the default one. So when you tag the, the ticket to the board, it will automatically end up in the default status column. Uh, you can also say that the status equals closing a, uh, a ticket. And you can even specify which close, which, uh, which close status to use uh, when closing the ticket. So to give you some, uh, some ideas on how it looks, uh, we are actually using this on the Federal Infrastructure Project now. Uh, so as you can see, we have a board that's called dev. Uh, that board, it comes with, it with the tag dev. It's a native board. If once for projects, you know, that are not, that have been done or that no longer relevant. Uh, and then if you click on the, on the configure here, you will end up in this, uh, in this page here. Every line is a, is a status. Every status is a column on the board itself. Uh, you can order them. You can set which one is the default. You can ch you can pick if one is a close and the corresponding close status. And then you can have a, you know pretty colors because that makes things a little bit nicer. Uh, the columns you see there you see there are basically the default statuses. So when you create a board, it basically uh, has no status. You have a button to create the default status, and those are the ones you're gonna get with this the default here and on the federal infrastructure we have added a, a few tickets here uh, you know to some of them are in backlog some of them are try edge in progress in review if you look at the same board today uh, you'll see that some of them are have moved to done uh, some of them have moved to try edge and so on so it's very simple 
uh, wrote, and I still want to be able to see if the ticket is assigned to someone or not, which is missing the UI here. Uh, but I'll, I'll be this soon. Um, it's pretty simple. It's very straightforward. But you know, it's a it's a board if you if you have a representation for your ticket. And I think that's pretty useful. The second feature that we're going to talk about are the collaborators level. So we have three, we had three SELs so far. You had the main admin, uh, you had admins, uh, you had, so the main admin was just, a, is an admin just like the others, except that he has his name on the, on the front page. Um, but he saw her name in the front page actually. The, but so we had three levels of SELs. You had admins, you had commit, and you had tickets. Um, Tickets, you would just allow, basically be allowed to edit tickets, metadata, assign tickets to people, uh, type them, uh, and so on. Commits give you commit access to the to the main Git repository, the sources, uh, as well as access to the private tickets, because it, it's expected that if you can fix the code, then you can access the private tickets. And then admins have access to all the feature, to all the, the settings as well. So we've added a fourth level here, which is called collaborator, collaborators, that sits between tickets and commits. And basically, it gives you a commit. It gives you ticket level on the UI, and on the main Git repo, it gives you commit level, but on a specific set of branches that have been granted to you when you've been added to the project as a collaborator. It uses pattern matching, uh, so you can give you know you can give someone access to everything that is starting every branch starting with features slash something. Feature slash is also going to be accepted, by the way. If you grant someone access to EPL star, uh, you'll get access to everything, including the EPL branch, uh, and so on. So, and you can also just, you know, train, uh, put the, the branch foo, and then they only have access to the exact branch foo and not uh, foo star something and so on. Um, so that gives us a little bit more flexibility on uh, adding people to, to project, including in this Git. Uh, so in this case, this is a screenshot on how it looks. Uh, you just go to the add user to the project via the settings. You click on the drop down. You set collaborators, and it's going to ask you for the for the list of branches that uh, of pattern of branches that this user is allowed to. So in this case, I was adding the CVNI user as a collaborator on the features and devel branch of Fedo Build. We've also added uh, HTTP push, uh, so you can now. Um, you can now push, uh, you know, via HTTP, and you don't have to go via SSH, uh, which is handy in some uh, networking environments. Uh, so it has two ways that it works, uh, depending on how Pagre is configured. If it uses local authentication, so if the user accounts and groups are managed within Pagger, uh, so to be clear, this is not the case on Pagger.io, and that is not the case on this Git. Um, but if you use that, the local authentication, then you know Pagger knows about your password, so you can provide username and password and push. If you use the OpenID or the OpenID Connect authentications, uh, currently Pagger.io and this Git are using the OpenID, and we should be migrating them to IDC uh, at one point. Uh, then we don't know your password, and we have no way to verify your password. So what you do is you, you're going to have to create an API token with the commit SEL. And then when you git push over HTTP, it's going to ask you for your username, which you know, and the API token. So instead of the password, it's going, it's, it's going to say password, as you can see in the screenshot here, but you'll have to provide the API token, and that will work. This has been currently enabled on staging Pagur, and I need to make the changes to enable this on Pagur.io production, as well as this kit. But we have it. It's a matter of configuring and restarting Apache, basically. Uh, we've added the possibility of customizing the new issue page. Uh, so when you have, uh, what you see on the right here is uh, creating a new issue on the Fedora infrastructure ticket tracker. Uh, and you know, it says, uh, you're about to open a ticket to the Fedora infrastructure team. If this is the first time you're doing this, you can find more information at this URL here. And that text is exactly the same one that is placed under a template folder, file name contributing.md, everything lowercase. And the text that I've put there, which you can see on the left side here, actually shows on the on the new page, uh, on the new issue page. So if you want, if you want to inform your contributor of what's going to happen once they have opened a new a new issue page, you know what's the workflow uh, for issues are then going to be uh, 
flag tagged assigned processed uh, if the tickets are automatically closed after two weeks of inactivity these kind of things uh, well these are things you can now uh, put forward when the people are opening the these tickets another feature is the the new issues uh, in, in the static in the stat stats page of a project in the issue tab on the left here uh, you can see these graphs uh, so we have two graphs that we have re remade regenerated uh, the, the old one looked didn't look as nice for one and there was actually some issues with the data itself i think they were not working as good as i planned them in the beginning so this is a v2 which uh, so far seems to be working quite well the first ticket is just a, a bar and for every week over the last year so it, it goes uh, 50, 52 weeks or so um, it tells you the number of tickets that have been opened that week and the number of tickets that have been closed that week. And in blue is the number of tickets opened and in red the number of tickets closed. And as you can see, there are a few weeks where we actually did close more tickets than were open. So these are the good weeks. And there are a few weeks where we got more tickets than we closed. And so those are the bad weeks. And the bottom graph is the, the same idea except that it's it's the number of tickets that were open in that week. So. Uh, if you look at this, this is again for the last year, uh, 52 weeks, and we can see that we started the, in August uh, 2019, we had about 140 tickets, it raised a little bit to 150, and then it, it went down quite a, quite a nicely until May, and then we had a little bit of an, a peak, and that's basically the beginning of the data center move, and then it's uh, slowing, uh, slowly going down again. Uh, so that gives you an idea about what's your backlog size and how it evolves. If it's growing up, if it's going down, if you're managing, uh, if you're managing to to keep up with it. Uh, so this is the Federal Infrastructure Tracker. If you look at the same page for the Pagur uh, project, you'll see an up an upward trend on the number of tickets opened over the last year, uh, just because we have more people asking for things than uh, than we are able to keep up with. Uh, so that's interesting. We've also added a few new API endpoints. Uh, I don't think this list is exhaustive, but these are the ones which I wanted to put forward here. We've added one for commits information. Uh, we have added one that lists the files in the Git repo, and we've added the possibility of deleting a project via the API. We have the possibility of creating so far. This is adding the possibility of deleting. So the commits info is, uh, this is an example of a commit. Uh, you can see the author's name. Uh, we don't display the author email. You, saw, you have the commit date uh, cat time as a uh, what's the name? the number of seconds since the first of January nineteen six seventy. That's uh, timestamp. Uh, you have thank it's you. Unix epoch <laughs> with a time offset uh, that I don't we, recognize. What is the time offset based on? That's the number of seconds. That's uh, directly what PyGit uh, PyGit two gives us oh, okay. for the for the commit. So these are information which. I get you extracts from the I guess that's the UTC minus um, hours in, not, in seconds. That's what that looks like. Uh, that's probably it. Yeah, that should be it. It's the, it's gonna be the so it's gonna be the commit time. And the question is is the commit time in local time or in UTC and then the time zone? It's probably going to be commit time in local time and then the offset records the difference between the local time and the UTC time zone. Uh, so yeah, fun. <laughs> Uh, then we have the, the committer because uh, commits can be authored by someone and pushed by someone else. Uh, in which in which case the author and the committer differ. In this case, uh, that was a pull request that I merged, and therefore I've, I did not push the commit and Neil did. Then you have the commit hash itself. You have the message of the commit, and finally you have the parents. So the parents has, is actually a list because merge commits will have multiple parents. Uh, this is a fast forward, so you have only one parent. And then you have the hash of the tree itself, you know, if you ever need it. Uh, second example of an outcome is the, the number of files in Git. So you can now browse um, the Git repository to figure out if there are files or folders uh, just using the API. Uh, you can see the content URL here is basically so. The first item is uh, is the alambic folder. The name is at uh, the name of the folder. The pass is it's at the top level of the the project. So the pass is just alambic. Uh, if you, if I had a full folder under alambics or version folders after alambic, it would have al alambic slash uh, versions. Uh, it says it's a folder and not a file. Uh, and then you have the content URL. So if you use the content URL, then and create that one, then you will get one level 
uh, lower in the in the Git repo and go into what's the content of that Alambic uh, folder itself. So you can now browse the content of the Git repo just uh, via the API and without having to do an actual Git clone or anything. Uh, we've also done a number of changes to uh, to Pagir itself. Uh, we've ported the test suite to run with PyTest, which is pretty nice because we were running Nose until now, and Nose is no longer supported. Uh, we are serving statics files with white noise. Um, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that one correctly, to be honest. Um, and it's it's pretty nice because it means the Apache, the, the, the web server, so Apache or JUnicorn is not the one serving the, the assets, which actually makes deploying Pagger on OpenShift a lot more a lot easier. Uh, we've also added the, the possibility of specifying the default branch of the Git repository upon creation. So we've had the opportunity of specifying the default branch for a long, long time in Pagger, um, pretty much as far as I can remember, basically. It's in the settings, and then you have the, the default branch, and you can set, well, uh, you know, master, develop, uh, whichever you want. Um, but, you know, you had to create a project, push something, and then go to the, to the UI and specify that. Uh, now you can directly do that at the creation. There is one one thing to be aware of, though, is that if you create a Git a project on Pagure, set the default branch, to, for example, to develop, and Git clone the, the Git repository, unless you've asked for the, the readme to be created. So if you didn't ask for the readme to be created, the Git repository, Git, right? the Git repository is going to be empty. And by default, uh, Git is going to make to place you in the master branch. So at that point, you'll have to do a git checkout minus b uh, develop, add your uh, files there, git push develop, and everybody else who is going to clone your git repo is going to end up directly in the develop branch then. Uh, but the first the first operations on an uh, on empty repo that you just clone uh, will be on the master branch, even if the even if on Pagure you've set the default branch to be something so else. So note that. Um... There, so, one thing that may like one thing that for this particular feature, um, at least that I'm tracking, and I don't know whether this will make this particular feature better, is that Git is making this configurable. I don't know if it's possible for us right now to make it so that we can make a default branch set um, in an empty repo by setting the property in the bare repo that we create. But if that is something that we can do. Um, that might actually enhance this feature. I, I, my reading of the feature in Git itself is that this is not yet the case, but it could be. So um, it, we will probably eventually be able to fix that particular quirk. Which would be nice. So a few of the changes that we've made here actually has made Pagur a lot easier to deploy on, uh, on containers in OpenShift. Uh, for example, the fact that you can do HTTP push now means that you no, no longer have to deal with SSH and access of the of SSH of, uh, to the Git repository and managing this. Um, so that's one less container to take care of, and that's one less uh, piece of security that you need to, to look after. Uh, white noise is also uh, nice because it makes the, the configuration, configuring Pagur to work on, on container a lot easier. Uh, again, you don't have to deal with Apache, you can just use uh, Gunicorn and it will, uh, and Pagur will take care of this entire section of the configuration for you. And I have checked it actually. So one of the things we were doing to force reload of statics files upon releases was that we, we would append the, the version number at the end of the static file. Uh, so, you know, if you go from Pagure uh, 5.10 uh, to 5.11, the, the URL changes and therefore your browser reloads the file. Uh, with white noise anymore, with white noise, we don't need this anymore. So we'll just be able to remove that uh, that little trickery. And, uh, and white noise is uh, smart enough to figure out if the file has changed or not. And, and we'll let you read or load it or use your cache version for that. So, so uh, now let's move from uh, from the upstream to to the disk git. Uh, well, we've over the last year we've added integration with release monitoring, uh, so an ETI integration. You can just uh, specify uh, if you want, you know, no monitoring, monitoring, or monitoring and scratch builds, and an ETI creates that information from the API and behaves accordingly. Uh, then you're necessarily. We have added Bugzilla overrides. 
uh, so what you see on the right on the right hand side is the the, the screenshot of the the information you see Bexilla Saini for Federa and EPL. Uh, you see two different people here. If you click on the edit, then you see uh, the the screenshot on the left side, uh, and you can reset to default, and that will be the, the the main admin of the project, or you can set it to someone else. Um, just there is just one thing there is that if you are the the EPL field will show regardless of the of the project. Act uh, branches or support in Bozilla for EPL. Um, that is, um, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. So if your package doesn't have EPL field, if it has, then you can set it to, to whatever you want. Uh, something else that we've added, and that was uh, something that just landed this morning because we love deploying things just before a conference. Uh, I guess virtual conference makes that a little bit less risky though. Um, single click or fan. So when you are fan a project, when you give the project to someone, uh, in this case, if on this bit you were to give the project to the fan user, uh, you would still have access to the project. It normally doesn't remove you from the project. You just change the main admin. And it doesn't change your watch status. So if you're, uh, if you're watching the project and uh, after, the, after you give and potentially remove yourself, you will still be uh, set as watching the, the project, which makes you CC'd on Bugzilla tickets and so on. Your fun, uh, your fun button here will do everything in one go for you. And that is a feature from Michal. So if you see him on RSC, feel free to give him cookies. I'm sure you'll like it. Uh, it basically will give the, the, the project to your fun user faction would do but you would also remove you uh, from the from the package so you won't have the access anymore and it will reset the watch status of the project so if you use that button which i highly encourage uh, you basically get everything done for you in one go in uh, also sends a federal messaging notification on the bus that this project was offered and we have a dedicated uh, offhand topic uh, and the opposite is true also. Uh, we've added uh, the single click adopt. So every or fund, uh, actually, you know, you have a, a single button and it will make you the main admin of the project. It will send a notification about it as well. But the only thing is that you will see, um, you will when you load the page, you'll see the button is disabled. It will appear or not. And that's because it's going to check if the package is, is retired or not. So if the, if the package is retired, you won't be able to earn a fund it without going through a review process. Um, if the package is off but not retired, uh, you'll just uh, click that one button and, and the package will be yours. So those are the, some of the things we've worked on this year. Uh, we do have a few more ideas and roadmaps, and I'll let uh, Niels uh, comment to. So uh, with the with the road. Our current um, existing roadmap that we're looking at right now, this is like within the next few months or so, depending on how things work out. Uh, we are going to be retiring a whole bunch of functionality we don't use anymore. And that's Gitalite. Um, and we're going to switch to the Pagger auth backend. We'll probably use Pagger authorized keys for the default because that doesn't require people to figure out how to configure SSHD, which is no fun. Um, but we did document all that. So yay, that should be very straightforward for people to set go that route. Repo Spanner support, Repo Spanner is unfortunately um, kind of dead. Um, and it doesn't quite work even when it wasn't dead. So we're just going to rip it out and that'll simplify things considerably. If somebody wants to revive this particular functionality of being able to do um, clustered or HA Git storage, I mean, yeah, we can look at it again. I mean, it's just going to be removed in Git. We can always revive it later. Um, Python 2 support, uh, that is the only thing blocking this at this point is that we've got to upgrade Pagger.io uh, because it's the only server left of the Pagger instances that are actually out in the wild that runs on, on Python 2. Everybody else is Python 3. Um, Fed message support, obviously, I think this has been beaten to death enough last year. We switched from using Fed message to Fedora messaging based on AMQP. We're the only active instance of Fed message today, and ours is moribund is the nicest way to put it. And so that's gonna, that, that'll be a nice bit of cleanup. Um, oh, right, and and I forgot about CentOS also using Python too. Yeah, we need to, we'll, we'll, we'll get both of these guys, both CentOS 
git.centos.org and packer.io up to the to using the EL8 builds running on Python 3, and then we'll be good to go there. Um, but a couple of things that are kind of exciting that I think a lot of people will like is just little quality of life improvements is that moving to support Kerberos as an authentication mechanism for everything. Um, so we already do this for Koji. Koji uses Kerberos. Um, and Fed Package can already orchestrate Kerberos um, authentication tickets being passed through to different services. So adding support for this into Packer will make it so that people don't have to deal with different ways to um, authenticate across the services to complete the basic workflow. So you do can it once, then you'll be able to commit, you'll be able to push, you'll be able to build all of it. Um, and this is pushed through HTTPS. So um, at that point, we will no longer require that you need SSH access to do anything. So... Yeah. Um, so question in here, cross repo code indexing, you want to find usages of a macro. Um, so I've been looking into this particular idea. I am unsure of how to do this, uh, mostly because I think every avenue leads to us deploying Elasticsearch somewhere, which I don't know how I feel about that. Um, it could work. Um, if anyone's got any ideas of like how to do this implementation, keep in mind, Packer itself is written in Python. We would really like to like integrate it nicely with all the other stuff that we have. Um, please come and talk to us about it because like that would really be very helpful, I think, for a lot of use cases. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there is no open source solution out there right now that does this sort of full global indexing to let you search and do stuff like that. Um, so that is definitely something that I would, I, I would be interested in if somebody wants to file an issue and ask for it. Uh, I, can, uh, Pingu, I can't answer this question. So what is the future of source.fedoraproject.org? I think you probably want to uh, wait for the CPE talk that's going to happen later on in, in, in Nest. Um, that's probably where that's going to be answered. But I would say that right now, I would say that it's it's probably going to stay um, in Packer based because there's a ton of integrations and support and custom functionality that is built around um, our message bus, around the API that we have for Packer, as well as a lot of other things. So like if, if it's, if, if the, yeah, so that for now, just assume it's staying as it is and, and don't worry about it. We'll figure it out later. Um, but yeah, so like that's that's what we've got right now for the initial roadmap ideas. Um, and so reasons for orphaning is something that's coming up next. I believe uh, Mikhail has already got some initial work done for this and it'll just need to be plumbed through for a future for the future release. Um, automatically notifying the devil list on the new orphan. This is more message bus fun stuff. Um, but yeah, we, this is, these are all things that, uh, yeah, yeah. The Julian mentions in the, in the chat that the re adding the reason for orphaning is actually already a pull request that we are reviewing and that will, and once we've merged that and cut a release for that, that'll actually become available to everybody. Um, that notifying the devil list on new orphan. That's going to take a little probably bit. land on 512 and the notifications. We just need to figure out if we put this as part of the of Pagero, if we use a, a third party seeing like toddlers uh, to do that. Oh, the, loop of, the toddlers thing. Yeah. yeah, it might make sense to do it in the toddlers thing since it would. Um, but because then that way it will be asynchronous and scale. So, and to, before we open up to more questions, uh, some statistics about the projects. Um, so this is basically uh, every year, the number of commits, the number of contributors, and the number of tickets open and closed and pull requests open and closed for the year. Um, so you can see that definitely uh, 2019 and 2020 are lower, are much slower uh, from the development side than, they, than we used to be. Uh, the number of commits has, was divided by three in, in 2019 and uh, uh, divided by two again in 2020. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, I am no longer working on Pagger uh, primarily. Uh, 
So there is that. There, the number of contributors has, uh, has decreased a little bit, although Julian in the chat here is definitely one of the most active one at this day. And Neil is always uh, d good at doing the, the people relation or the, the public relation side of the, of the project and doing a good job at this. But it's interesting to look at the number of tickets closed. So 2019 was not a good year. Uh, so we only closed 36% of the ticket opened of the amount of ticket open. Uh, 2019, 2020 is actually looking much nicer. Uh, we are closing about 60% of the number of tickets that are open. Uh, but you, we can see that the number of pull requests, the number of pull requests closed is actually, uh, we always basically, every contribution that is made to Pegger uh, is closed. Uh, we do have a few pull requests that are, that are still open to this day, but most of them are actually uh, integrated and reviewed and integrated uh, as they are open. Um, so, yeah, we have more tickets. To, we have more tickets opening than we have uh, than we are about to close. But the contributions that are made uh, normally makes it uh, into the code base, and that's quite quite nice to see. Uh, the number of contributors is also interesting to see. It definitely dropped over the last few years, uh, but it's also 2020 looks to be uh, in the same range of 2019, uh, which is also nice. Um, so yeah, there is a. We can see there is a dent. We can see there is a a lower turnaround of code than, than we have seen uh, years before. Uh, we are also reaching project maturity to some extent. Uh, I know some people still have problems with the UI, with some of the, there are still bugs for sure, uh, but in the number of features, we are also, uh, we are also not doing too bad for, for what we need, uh, for what we need from Pagger. Um, so that could explain that as well. And with this, I'll... Uh... Well, I, I want to say just a small bit about the stats. Um, one thing to, to when you when you look at this data, what the, as Pierre said that there's this maturity in the level here that that's starting to show up. Uh, ooh, Pierre dropped off. That's probably bad. Um, uh, so as Pierre said, that there's this maturity level in here, um, but also what it indicates is that there is uh, from the the primary users of of Pegger today, which are Fedora and CentOS, they have essentially reached the feature lit, um, levels that they expect, that they want for the workflows. And so there is, there has been, at least in my analysis, having started doing a lot of the ticket triage this year, uh, a lot less requests for new stuff and just, uh, and, and just a more mentioning of uh, just more bugs or quirks kind of things to deal with. I mean, we've had feature requests and we've integrated those as we mentioned earlier. We've got Kanban boards now and we've got um, an API for traversing uh, a Git repo without having to clone it. Those were feature requests from teams and people who needed it. Um, and we've got collaborators, which is a Diskit specific, which is a feature that a lot of Diskit people wanted. So now we have those. But in general, I think we've, we've started to reach a point where people are generally satisfied with the feature set that they have. And, and this is a big part of what I've been doing now is getting new people to start um, looking at, at um, Pagger as a solution. And this is where things have started to get kind of exciting because we now have one of our first non Fedora instances out in the wild. And that is from the MidiPix project where they've now got a, uh, a, a nice um, instance running based on Pagger 5.10.0 as of right now. And it is the, uh, they were very happy about this, min, uh, about this solution. And they're actually the first instance I'm aware of that also doesn't even run on Fedora CentOS. It runs on OpenSUSE. So this is actually an OpenSUSE based instance running on essentially the latest version of Pagger and they're they're very happy with it so far. Like I've been talking to them about it, and they're very pleased with it. They love the API, and there's some work going on right now to write some simple tools in C for being able to interface with Pagger um, from the terminal. Um, you know, there's some in Haskell, there's some in Python, there's some in there's actually some in Perl. I found a little while ago. Um, but you know, these guys are very C oriented, and the project that they're working on. Um, is essentially implementing a POSIX environment for a POSIX environment for Windows on top of Windows NT directly, um, and so for them, like C is the language that they're comfortable with, and they're building tools based on that. Um, 
Leonardo is asking why no Rust. I mean, if you want to write a Rust one, it's it's not hard. If you can work with a REST API that returns responses in JSON, you can write a client and do anything you want. Uh, oh, right. And there's the Free Software Foundation considering using Pagger as a hosting platform. That is still ongoing. Um, the um, global um, pandemic thing has sort of slowed everything down a lot. But I'm actively talking to them and working with them on, on this sort of thing. Uh, so... Yeah, the Free Software Foundation is actively interested in this, and I've been working with them on, on that. We've actually handled some bugs and feature requests for them um, as part of this. So uh, it's generally been, I think, where it, the growth curve has been very slow and steady, but people are starting to take interest and take note in it. There's a few other projects that are also interested in deploying it, um, uh, mainly because it's very flexible, it's very customizable, and it's very small. Um, and it being written in Python makes it super extensible, which is something that a lot of people have told me is something that they don't have from other solutions out there. So that's been, so I think we, we've got something really good here and it's very, it's, it's been, it's been increasing in its, in its slow binding of success, slow bit of success. So yeah. Um, any other questions from anybody from to either Pierre or myself? Oh yes. And Jens Peterson. Want to shout out for your for Haskell binding to Pagger that you wrote for F branch, which is super cool. So, any other questions and stuff? And anyone interested in rolling out Packer on their own instances somewhere? Oh, can we have a dashboard view showing packages that are about to be retired and merge trains? Uh, Pierre, you wanna you wanna answer these particular questions? Like merge trains sounds uh, interesting, and the dashboard thing is potentially simpler. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the I'll start uh, in the order in which they appear in the chat here. Uh, the dashboard is something which we could do we have the information in the data, in the database so it's basically uh, about querying it and displaying it uh, so that shouldn't be hard to do uh, we'll need to figure out how to do how to but it shouldn't be hard to do uh, the merge train id i think we already have it uh, in the it has a different name that's called zul <laughs> and zul has the possibility and supports bigger and has the possibility of running your test uh, merging you can create uh, pull request dependencies in Zool. Uh, so you can say, well, project A, need, pull request one in project A needs to be merged for pull request one in project two uh, to merge for pull request three in project C to be merged. And Zool is going to test uh, project C with the pull request uh, two of project B merged with the pull request A, uh, one of, of project A merged. Uh, and if the tests are passing on every single pull request, and if the tests are passing on the last one with the previous one merged, then it will merge uh, pull requests one, pull request, pull request three in one atomic operation. They are not called merge train, but they are already there, and we are the use, and that is the, the I think one of the biggest CI system out there because that's what the OpenStack project uses. Billion or trillions or quadrillions of uh, items or project, I should say, they are not even Python's only uh, project out there that they contribute and mentor uh, and maintain for some of them. Yeah, no, that's. Uh, I, I think uh, the that might make th this um, concept a little easier for people to grok might be maybe we need some way to add reporting to Packer's interface about this sort of thing happening. I don't know exactly how we would do that, but this might dovetail into some of the enhancements uh, into how PR flags work that we've been talking about for a little while. Um, uh, so for background here, we're looking at enhancing the way that um, CI systems can interface with with Packer to give a richer um, information base for, pe for people to look at pull requests. And so there might be some opportunities there to enhance this to 
uh, to make this a more coherent view for people to understand that things like the merge train concept are actually already happening. But we'll see. The, the, the main difference with the merge train is that they are not part of Pagur itself, which to some extent I would consider as a feature more than a, a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So like something to keep in mind when we're talking about the CI stuff for Pagur, CI is not built into the system. You are intended to plug a CI system into it. The disadvantage of this is it makes it a little bit more difficult to have CI set up for your projects. The positive for this is that if your CI needs to be weird, it is a lot easier to handle that. Um, if you have to do very complicated or specialized things, it is much easier to plug into Pagger than it is to other systems that have integrated CI because they have a model of how CI is supposed to work and don't provide you the flexibility to make those things. So yeah, it's uh, there's pluses and minuses, I think, for what Fedora does and what you know distros do which is heavily integration based, our, this model works out a lot better because we can be a lot more flexible and we can actually model, model the way that we do stuff um, a lot more effectively. So hopefully that answers that more completely for people. Well, thank, I mean, it's not just, you know, like everyone's saying great project and stuff in the chat. I wanna say it's not just because of us, it's because of all of you guys. All of y'all, you know, you can you use it, you contribute to it, even with even filing issues or making pull requests or even helping with the documentation and things like that. Just the, all of that stuff makes this so much better. We wouldn't be anywhere close to as good as we are if it weren't for all of y'all. And so that is that is what makes this so successful and so great. So thank you all for that. Uh and if you didn't, and if you didn't know, you now know why Neil is the the public relation person for Pagur. Edward, if there if there needs some love for that, please file an issue so that we don't lose it because <laughs> like this chat is not per persistent. <laughs> so um, if there's if one there's of issues the, with the Pagur mark, thing is that the. Sorry, what, Pierre? Uh, just, yeah, so the question from Edward in the chat here is that the, the documentation for the Pagger Magdons needs some love. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that we only the default uh, Magdon documentation, so we didn't duplicate, uh, which I think we linked to. Uh, so only the watch documentation, the very basic, uh, and then what is specific to so, and mentioning linking these kind of things, uh, the rest is supposed to be, uh, you know, go and find it in the upstream documentation about Markdown. Um, but then having yet another place where we document uh, Markdown. It was a little bit the idea, but yeah, uh, it could be that it doesn't mean that it doesn't need some love. And I'm more than happy to, uh, to look into that if uh, I'm put it to. request which is even nicer <laughs> yeah sure um and the, and the good the good thing about the part of your documentation is that you get to mark down in rest which is very nice and very yeah uh, restructured text is way nicer than almost all the other formats that we have to deal with i i i like that um but yeah uh i think that's it for everyone is there any if there's nothing any else i think questions? we'll just wrap up yeah. Everyone for joining. Uh, have a nice day. Yeah. Thank y'all.